Okay, welcome to part three of our discussion of cells of the nervous system in Psych 210. This time we're talking about ion movement. And okay, I know that doesn't sound super exciting, but trust me, this is really, it's really cool stuff. Ion movement is like kind of the smallest piece of how neurons talk to one another, which is kind of how the whole human experience and in consciousness thing happens. So bear with me. Uh, ion movement is actually super cool. I think by the time we're done with all of this, you'll agree with me. Okay, let's talk ion movement. Uh, the first thing that I want to talk about is the concentration gradient or the force of diffusion. This is just the basic idea. The molecules will move from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration, right? You can imagine putting salt or something like that into a glass of water. You watch the salt, it spreads out and um, diffuses until it's evenly distributed. Molecules just do this, right? That's the force that drives them. Things that are packed closely together want to be evenly distributed in their medium. So concentration gradient is one of the things that drives the movement of ions, high concentration to low concentration. There's also electrostatic pressure. This is the idea that like charges repel and opposite charges attract. So if you have an area that is positively charged, it's going to attract negatively charged ions. Um, like charges repel, opposite charges attract. Remember that. Uh, there's also the, uh, so I wanna clarify right now that these two things are passive diffusion forces. Right, so they are going to happen without any energy necessary. The ions just move in this way. You don't have to use any machinery or any energy to do this. It just happens. The sodium potassium pump is a form of active transport. This uses energy, ATP, to pump three sodium ions out of the cell and two potassium ions into the cell. Okay, next piece of information. Fluid contains ions. Both the extracellular and intracellular fluid contain ions. Ions are charged molecules. Cations are positively charged, so things like potassium and sodium are positively charged ions. And ions are negatively charged. Things like chloride carry a negative charge. So you have positively and negatively charged ions dissolved in this fluid. Um, that means that every compartment that we're talking about is going to have a charge. It can be positive or negative um, along an entire spectrum of how positively or negatively charged it is. The difference between the charge in the extracellular fluid, or what's outside of the cell, and inside of the cell produces a membrane potential, right? So the inside of the cell is more negative than the outside of the cell because of the concentrations of ions being different within and without of the cell. In addition to the differences in how, how these compartments are charged, there are differences in concentrations of the ions as well. So there's a relatively low concentration of potassium outside the cell, but a high concentration inside the cell. Um, so multiple forces are going to be at work determining which way these ions want to move, right? And we'll go over this a couple of different ways, so don't worry if it's not making sense right away. Um, for example, because there is a lot of sodium outside of the cell and not very much inside the cell, the force of diffusion is going to drive sodium into the cell. Likewise, because the inside of the cell is negatively charged, electrostatic pressure is going to drive the sodium into the cell. Um, ions are going to move naturally along their gradients. This is passive transport. It requires no energy for the ions to flow. This happens via diffusion, right? Movement of particles from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration, or through that sort of electrostatic pressure that we talked about, opposite charges attracting to one another. This happens most easily through facilitated diffusion, right? Ions have a hard time moving across this phospholipid bilayer. They have a much easier time if they can move through a channel, right? They're not having to pass directly through the barrier this way. They can move through this little channel that's created by um, a protein that's embedded in the membrane. There's also active transport, which we mentioned earlier. Um, this is when energy is used to move ions against their gradients. This here is a depiction of a sodium potassium transporter or a sodium potassium pump. Basically, it's a protein that's embedded in the membrane that can use energy to pump these ions against, across their gradients, right? So it can push sodium out of the cell and move potassium into the cell, which is sort of the backwards way that these things would normally go. Um, we'll explain a little bit later in the context of the action potential exactly how this works 
um, and, and why it does work. So this is my favorite way to explain the sodium potassium pump. Unfortunately, this video is becoming um, dated, uh, but I refuse to remove it from my slides because I think it's just great. All right, so we have the moving of potassium into the cell and the movement of sodium out of the cell at the expense of ATP or energy. Okay, so now we know enough to talk about the resting membrane potential. The resting membrane potential is basically what the cell's state is when it's not being acted on by outside forces. At this point, the cell sits at about negative 70 millivolts. The inside of the cell is more negative than the outside. That's going to be really important for talking about how ions move. Uh, ion concentrations in the intracellular and the extracellular fluid are different. So because of those different compositions and some of the machinery that we have talked about and we will talk about that keep it that way, um, the inside of the cell rests at about negative 70, so it is more negative than the outside of the cell. Um, the membrane exists in a state of semi-permeability. The uh, resting membrane potential is in a state that we call dynamic equilibrium, which means movement of ions occurs across the membrane with no real net change in charge. So things will move back and forth, um, but it still rests at about negative 70 without any forces acting on it. Okay. Let's introduce a couple of key players in terms of ions, or I guess revisit those key players that we're going to keep talking about for the rest of this unit. Um, first off, we have sodium. Sodium is a positively charged ion, and it really wants to get inside the cell for two reasons, right? There is a decent amount of electrostatic pressure driving these positively charged ions into the cell, as well as pressure from their concentration gradient. There's less sodium inside the cell than outside. Also, the cell is negatively charged and sodium is positively charged. So for those two reasons, we have these two forces driving the sodium inside of the cell. Next up, we have potassium. Potassium is being driven out of the cell. It's also a positively charged ion, uh, but there is more pressure from its concentration gradient than its opposing electrostatic pressure gradient. So that can be a little confusing because this is a positively charged ion. It should be attracted within the cell. And there is a force pushing it in that direction. But because there's just so much potassium crammed into the cell, there's less potassium outside. So that force of diffusion, that concentration gradient is pushing it out, but the electrostatic pressure is trying to push it back in. Because the force from the concentration gradient is stronger, at the resting potential, potassium is going to be pushed out. As you can see here, chloride is much closer to being at sort of equilibrium, where there's a roughly equivalent amount of pressure from the concentration and the electrostatic pressure gradients. So which way chloride flows depends on the state of the membrane potential, which, which can change. Uh, we'll talk about that quite a bit. Okay, before we move on and talk about the action potential, let's get some terminology established. The first is depolarization. A change in the membrane potential towards zero relative to its normal resting potential. Basically, this means any event that causes the neuron to become more positive or less negative, whichever way is easier for you to think of. Um, if ions move in, so positively charged ions move in or negatively charged ions move out, that causes the resting potential to become more positive, less negative. We call that depolarization. Hyperpolarization is just the opposite, a change in the membrane potential away from zero relative to its normal resting potential. So if something makes the ion more negatively charged, less positively charged, whatever is easier for you to think about, moving this from negative 70 to a lower voltage, something like negative 90. So depolarization, less negative, more positive, up towards zero relative to its uh, normal resting potential. Hyperpolarization, more negative or less positive, a change in the number potential away from zero relative to its normal resting potential. If that terminology doesn't 100% make sense to you, that's okay. Uh, watch the video again, uh, reread the textbook, uh, whatever you need to do. It is super important and it is not going to go away. Okay, that uh, concludes our discussion of ion movement. Uh, not that we're done with talking about how ions move, but that just kind of concludes the, the discussion. Next time we're going to get into the action potential. And that's going to that's going to take some time to do, but I know it's kind of um it can be a lot of confusing a lot of, it can be confusing for a lot of people, but the action potential is awesome. It's it's one of the coolest things in neuroscience, I think. Um, it's like the smallest little unit of how neurons talk to one another, and I get really excited about that kind of stuff. So um, I know it's going to seem like a slog to try to get your head around it, but trust me, it, it's worth it. Okay, that's it for this time.